extend my warm Namaste I Swati Solanki researcher at Impri Impact and Policy Research Institute Prabhav evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan Nai Delhi extend my warm welcome to you all to Impri hashtag web policy talk Today we have gathered for a special talk on engaging the urban from the periphery as a part of the series the state of cities hashtag city conversations the series is organized by impri center for habitat urban and regional studies it is my privilege to introduce the eminent panelist for today's talk we have dr shubhra gururani who is associate professor at york university toronto canada we welcome you ma'am we have dr lorraine kennedy who is cnrs research director at ecole des hautes etudes en sciences sociales paris france we also have Dr. Ashima Sood, who is associate professor at Anand National University, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. We have Dr. Somyadeep Chattopadhyay, who is associate professor at Vishwabharati University, West Bengal, and a senior fellow at Impri. We also have a uh, Professor Carol Upadhyay, who is professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. We have Liu uh, Bing Zi, who is PhD scholar at Urban uh, University of California, Berkeley. We have Pratik Mishra, who is PhD scholar at King's College London, UK, and Ankita Rathi, who is research fellow at Institute of Rural Management, Anand, at Gujarat. Now we look forward to an enriching deliberation with our panelists. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Swati, and I welcome all of you for this very important deliberation today. And uh, I welcome all of you. I'm especially thankful for joining from different parts of the world on this very important topic uh, we are uh, deliberating today. So, without any further ado, I would like to invite Ashima, ma'am, to start with uh, uh, our presentation on this topic and take the panel forward. Ashima, ma'am, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, for having us here. Uh, and you know, we are really glad to be able to speak about these important topics. Today, uh, I know that uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay was to join us, and uh, you know we are still hopeful that he'll be here. Uh, but let me just get started, and you know, uh, start with the discussion today with a few remarks about the rationale and the origins of the discussion for uh, everybody who's joining us today. Uh, I think the occasion, uh, if you like, for our conversation today is the special issue that just came out uh, in. Uh, the journal Samaj, uh, South Asia Multidisciplinary Academic Journal. And uh, the issue title is Engaging the Urban from the Periphery, as you can see. Uh, so first, let me lay out a little bit of this, uh, the rationale, you know, where it is that, you know, we, we, why is it that we are talking today and at this particular moment uh, about the peri-urban and the peri-urban term. So first, let me put into context what, uh, you know, Professor Shofei Ren, uh, of Michigan State University. She's not here today, but in the afterward to our issue, she calls the peripheral turn in urban settings. And of course, in just a little bit, uh, Dr. Lorraine Kennedy will be speaking about how it is that we and others uh, have conceptualized the peripheral in relation to the urban. But before we do that, I thought, let me actually uh, remind, uh, remind ourselves that this next year, uh, 2022, will, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of uh, Gyan Prakash's celebrated essay on the urban turn in the Indian social science. And in fact, the new millennium has she seen a decisive shift in the policy and research attention to the urban problematic. And as Gyan Prakash argued in his essay very memorably, it was a very long time coming. So why now this peri-urban turn? Uh, so I think there are two or three important shifts, uh, shifts, so you can call them uh, maybe new recognitions about the trajectory of urbanization in India, uh, which underlie, I think, the sort of particular urgency of our discussion today. Uh, first, I think most important is this remarkable growth and efflorescence, if you like, flowering of the census now. Uh, in lay terms, perhaps for those of us you, uh, who are joining us today and our news or to some of these discussions, so in lay terms, we could think about the census town as an overgrown village. But in fact, in reality, there are something far, far more remarkable. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, between 2001 and 2011, 
Uh, the numbers of these census towns doubled from about 1400 to 3900, but more importantly, they contributed over a third of the overall urban growth in 2001 uh, to 2011, compared to only apparently 6% in the period 1991 to 2001. And I'm citing here some of the analysis. There's been a lot of analysis, but particularly numbers given by Roy and Pradhan in 2018. Now, uh, what are these census towns, right? As seats of urbanization without necessarily all the characteristics of cities, I think the challenges in uh, very special ways. And they represent this very intriguing new urban frontier and new forms of what uh, Dr. Shubhra Gaurarani and her co-authors have described as agrarian urbanization. I think there's a second context to our discussion today, which you know, I talk about a little bit in my paper, which is, uh, and you know, not just me, but many of us have been saying this, uh, that real estate capital is remaking the cartography of the urban in India and across the global south in unprecedented ways. Yet unlike the subaltern urbanization of the census towns, which I was just describing, it is clustering unmistakably in the vicinity of India's largest mega cities and million plus. In the process, it is creating what I have called a new kind of speculative map of future urban. And it will have very important implications that we are just now beginning to trace on governance, migration patterns, informal urban growth, as well as social spatial inequality. Uh, so that's sort of broadly the context for our discussion today. But let me also take this opportunity to thank the many participants and well-wishers on our journey so far. Uh, this issue had its genesis with uh, Dr. Lorraine Kennedy's call to renew concepts and categories around the peri-urban question. And the call was crystallized in a series of panels that we organized in 2019 at the RC21 conference uh, with, uh, of course, Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Gururani, and myself. And uh, we were really fortunate to have participated in our discussion scholars from multiple continents and speaking about the peri-urban condition, not only in India, but also Colombia, Kenya, and Ghana. And we are very thankful to the discussants at those panels, uh, Shoshana Goldstein, George Jose, and Aditya Singh. And we are also very thankful, of course, to the contributors who enriched our understanding at the panel, especially Rasula Kundu, Eric Denis, Thomas Cohen, uh, Mary Helene Zara, Sudeshna Mitra, Sebastian Santa Maria, Robin uh, Janven Dujin, uh, Chetan Chotani, Jan Nijman, Antia Chaudhary, Karen Pfeiffer, Berenice Bond, and Michael Schwinn. And we are very fortunate to have some of our contributors here today, of course. Uh, and that includes Professor Carol Upadhyay, Pratik Mishra, Ankita Rathi, and Yubing Shri. And uh, thank you again to the Impri team for being such generous hosts. And now over to you, Varun. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashima, for introducing um, the, the, the webinar today. Um, you know, in our introduction to this, this special issue um, that I co-wrote with, with Shubra uh, Gururani, um, we use, you know, periphery as, as a concept uh, rather than as a, as a spatial category. Um, you know, we, we borrow from Teresa Caldera the idea of the periphery as a problem space. Um, and so, so I want to be clear that, that, you know, we're not limited to looking at, say, the fringes of metropolitan cities. This is a much, uh, this is a much uh, broader kind of a, of a process, as as Ashima mentioned, you know, um, it, it's it's actually become a very vibrant uh, field of, of, of research, um, and and we're not only talking about what might be considered, you know, subordinate spaces, but rather, you know, endogenous kinds of processes which are happening across, you know, the country. Um, Ashima mentioned census towns and. Uh, and uh, we can think of small settlements as well. Um, you know, the, the periphery also is conceptual in the sense that it, it evokes non-mainstream. Uh, and this includes in urban scholarship. Uh, hence the title of the special issue, engaging the urban from the periphery. And so a key question is, you know, what can these types of 
of, of studies uh, bring to the conversation uh, in, in urban studies and especially urban theory. Now we know that urbanization in India is driven uh, these days by processes that are playing out uh, in the peripheries. And you know, we can think of large scale infrastructure projects, for instance, which are often state driven. Um, we can think of real estate investments. Ashima also mentioned this. Um, these are mainly private sector driven. Um, we also include in our, in our research these kind of incremental processes that are, that are playing out and that are more uh, the result of, of kind of very decentralized, small scale landowners who are seizing opportunities to, to leverage their, their plots and, uh, and, and buy into the, you know, the city uh, of the future. Um, now, scholarship shows us that, that peri-urban spaces are sites of, of contest, contestation. And um, we can, uh, I think, most visibly see, and this is apparent in the, in the literature as well, uh, the fierce competition for land and resources. Um, the the peri-urban is also the site of competing land uses. Uh, I think we all have in our mind these images of which are kind of dissonant images of uh, rice fields or, or buffalo herds interspersed with uh, uh, housing complexes and, uh, and, and private residential schools or, or uh, self-built um, communities. Now in this special issue of Samaj, um, we adopted a kind of a common thread throughout our, our papers uh, to study these spaces. And, and this is through looking at what we call relational constructedness and, and the co-production of space by different categories of actors located at different spatial scales um, from the local to, to the global. Um, the papers in the collection interrogate and engage with this idea of co-production across three main arenas, space, politics, and subjectivities. Now the production of space or the transformation of the, built, uh, the urban built environment uh, is, is one major area. Um, we know that concrete infrastructures like roads and bridges uh, and airports rely on uh, financial infrastructures and on policy instruments, including ad hoc special purpose vehicles. Ashima and I have, have worked on these uh, issues over, over the last years and, there, and there's a, a growing body of research uh, looking at this. Um, secondly, politics. The co-production of peri-urban space is fundamentally a political process and all of the papers in the issue explore this dimension. Uh, I can mention Carol and, and Sashin Kumar's paper on the land struggles and caste in peri-urban Bengala. Uh, Ashima uh, also examines how um, migrants and other vulnerable groups seek to claim their right to the city while confronting assertive and revanchist upwardly mobile middle classes in Delhi and in uh, Hyderabad. Ankita investigates how agrarian dynamics embedded in regimes of caste, land, and work permeate and co-produce both the urban and the rural on the basis of her work in a small town in, in Punjab. And thirdly, subjectivities. You know, peri-urban spaces are aspirational spaces. And um, we, we have proceeded on the premise that, that spaces and subjectivities are relationally co-constructed. For instance, Pratik in his paper probes how mobility and migration intersect with urban policies to produce peripheral subjects and examines the, he examines specifically the decision uh, in Delhi to shift polluting industries uh, here, brick uh, making to the urban periphery and the subjective of experience of brick workers as they circulate between jobs across the rural urban frontier. And Yubing in his paper questions how and whether residential cohabitation of diverse social groups in peri-urban areas contributes to re-scripting social relations and forging new subjectivities. His paper is a comparative study of Hyderabad and Chengdu 
on the basis of some selected residential types, which are emblematic of those found in peri-urban India and China. Now we have the good fortune of having all but one of our contributors here with us today. And so they will say more about their papers and we're looking forward to that. And before I uh, hand the, the mic over to Carol, I'd like to just say thanks to IMPRI for giving us this opportunity to share our, our recent work. Over to you, Carol. Thanks, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Um, Please go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, I'm there. Sorry. So uh, we are supposed to give a very brief um, overview of our paper so we can leave enough time for discussion. Um, the paper which I contributed and wrote with um, my colleagues, Sachin Rathod, um, was called a uh, cast at the city's edge, land struggles in Perry urban Bangalore. Um, this paper <clears throat> um, came out of a, a long-term project that um, uh, we were carrying out at, in Bangalore with colleagues at University of Minnesota called Speculative Urbanism, where we intended to look at um, the, the various kinds of changes that are being set in motion by real estate-led development in Bangalore where we work in both a core city site and a peri-urban site. Um, and in the peri-urban villages where we um, carried out research, our interest was in understanding the ways in which agricultural land is alienated from farmers, um, mainly through market transactions and converted into real estate. Um, and the villages um, that are described in this paper were selected because they are the site of one of the largest residential, high-end residential apartment complexes um, in Bangalore, um, which was built on around 100 acres of land, which was purchased from around 100 um, households in one village. Um, but um, as we started doing research there, we discovered that agricultural land and as well as common lands were being converted um, into real estate um, for other purposes as well and in more incremental ways and especially through what are often tagged as illegal practices and transactions or um, we could um, call them informal practices. Um, and this is because of course, as you know, many um, scholars have now documented in peri-urban sites that um, with the rising demand for land and rising land values, a lot of money starts coming into land markets um, creating a kind of a speculative booms where all kinds of people are investing in land. Um, and what we kept hearing about a lot in these villages is um, land grabbing, which is um, a larger term, um, which actually is used in the Eng English term is used in Canada. And there's a larger discourse or political discourse in Bangalore around land grabbing in the context of the great kind of real estate boom that um, Bangalore has seen over the last um, um, two decades or so. Um, and so one of the things that kept coming out um, at us as we carried out research there was the ways of various ways in which caste um, was permeating these kinds of transactions and permeating really the operations of land market itself. Um, and this is not something which is entirely unexpected, but I think what we found most um, fascinating was the was ways in which caste was, was intervening in these processes. Um, in ways in which were kind of unexpected. And in other words, we, we know from many studies that you know, the powerful uh, so-called dominant caste, land-owning caste, do tend to have more um, advantage in new land markets, and they are the ones who are best able to accumulate capital and wealth um, through transacting in their own land and also acting as intermediaries in new land markets, um, which is what we saw in this case also. But um, the other side of it was the resistance that was being put up by Dalit groups um, who, who um, were arguing that it was their land in particular and common lands that were being appropriated illegally by ready um, landlords and by outsiders um, who were trying to accumulate land in these villages. And so we became, became very interested in um, the past politics of land that was, um, that was emerging in these sites. Um, and began to think about questions about how caste is being reconfigured um, and re-spatialized through these struggles. Um, and so the paper is about how caste is reconfigured as a mode of accumulation as well as an axis of struggles around land. Um, and 
that so therefore we try to to contribute to a to a broader understanding of the processes by which um, urban peripheries are being co-produced by social interactions of various groups, uh, whether they are acting in concert or at cross purposes. Um, <clears throat> So while members of the locally dominant ready caste who were major, who were the major landowners in the villages in these villages um, were best placed to engage in land grabbing, um, we found that Dalits were also participating in the market in, in interesting ways, particularly as brokers. And they were building on the knowledge that they gained and the contacts that they were able to um, develop through their activities in the land market to contest what they were, were claiming as the appropriation of the, of the lands by, by Wadis. Um, and the paper details the various ways in which both land grabbing is taking place um, and very complicated ways, I should say, not, not through one kind of route, and also the various modalities to which um, Dalits challenge the social power of Wadis in this context. Um, and to do that, um, we also had to frame this, this particular very kind of micro level cases within the larger regional context. And I had to spend a lot of time going back into the Agarian history of Mysore, of the Mysore region in order to understand, really to explain the kind of, um, the ways in which place embedded caste identities um, seem to be informing struggles around land in the context of urbanization. Um, the paper is situated within the larger um, framework of agrarian organization, which Shubhada has been elaborating on for several years now, which argues that we need to attend to the specific regional and agrarian locations and histories of cities if we are going to understand these complex processes of, of urbanization. Um, and because in South Asia, as we all know, land building and agricultural production have historically been grounded in past, um, and and a grounding which has um, very significant regional um, variations. Um, our larger argument is that we really need to attend to the intersections of caste and land much more carefully within particular agrarian formations if we are going to make sense of the kind of urban transitions that we are seeing in um, peri-urban sites, such as this one. Um, and as Shubhada has pointed out in her writing, that you know this this, histo this historical entitlement of land and caste has been well documented in agrarian and, uh, and rural studies, and yet only is only recently becoming a topic of, of interest in urban scholarship. Um, so, and the other part of the larger argument that I'm working towards in this paper and another paper that was recently published, um, drawing on the case of Amaravati in Andhra is that we need to look beyond a kind of simplistic understanding of caste as simply another axis of social and economic inequality or as a basis of political identity that, that is invoked and deployed in particular situations. Rather, I'm trying to build up this notion, you know, drawn from earlier work of Barbara Harris Wright and others, uh, of understanding caste as a social structure of accumulation. Um, whose particular characteristics are defined by regionally specific histories of development, modes of production, systems of political authority, um, and collective memories of oppression and struggle. From this perspective, I think if we look at these struggles around land that, that are unfolding across India um, in uh, all kinds of sites, not only peri-urban, but of course, the large literature on land acquisition um, and so on, um, we begin to see how caste is really at the center of processes of, of, of where land, agrarian land is taking on new values and affordances in the context of, of being appropriated to real estate or in the context of urbanization. As land becomes a site of speculative investment, um, we see caste also being uh, reconfigured and redeployed in important ways. Uh, and in particular, as an access, access of struggle. Um, so I'll stop here um, to give time to others. Thank you. Over to you, Ankita, I believe. Ankita, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this paper is essentially uh, part of my PhD thesis, uh, which I submitted last year. And uh, the fieldwork for this paper was conducted uh, in 2015, 2016, in the Patiala district of uh, Punjab. Uh, so the primary motivation uh, for this paper and as, as also for my PhD thesis was to try and understand, uh, uh, to try and speak to this body of work that has been trying to investigate urban beyond the city, uh, 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 urban, 
in the in the in the in the, in the larger in the global case looking at new ranks of global cities uh, apart from the from those in the global north uh, in the indian case trying to look at urban peripheries of existing big cities or uh, uh, rural, rural villages rural villages across the highways and small towns uh, in the indian case uh, especially there's been a mounting interest as ashima mentioned there's been a mounting interest to study these uh, new urban new urban small towns and new urban centers uh, more so as the 2011 census of india uh, revealed growth of these new census towns essentially these are small towns uh, scholars uh, have have characterized them as suburban urbanization because much of these these small towns uh, are spatially away are spatially autonomous from any big city and and there's been a great effort to kind of understand how uh this autonomy has kind of works so uh in this context uh, i also kind of uh, my paper is kind of in this line of work i i study a small town called patna uh, uh in in the patiala district of punjab uh patiala which is part of the princely state until the 19 until the pre independence period and it's it's a class 3 urban center and it's it's it uh, it's a class 3 urban center it's located in the southwestern part of patiala and uh um it 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 was it was designated it was a, essentially a small agrarian village until the 1960s it was in only the 1971 uh, it was designated it was given the status of a notified area committee when a when a fci when when a fci was uh, the food corporation of uh, institution was set up there in 1966 and a state uh, and a state led uh, agro purchase center was was set up there in 1971 uh therefore it was given the status of notified area committee by the 1990s it was uh, it was a nagar council and now it's a municipal council uh, so it's a small town uh when you look at the town it 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 almost seems like it has this strong agrarian character strongly it it has a vibrant uh, uh mandi it's it's a mandi town uh it's an it's a it's a fairly it has a it it is a big agro purchase center of paddy and wheat and 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 uh, and also has a vibrant uh, cons- consumption goods economy a bazaar economy as you would say uh so uh i i i would like to just focus on one key argument that i make in trying to understand patna's urban transformation uh from a very small agrarian village to a to a agro commercial hub uh i i argue that patna kind of represents a case of peripheral urbanization not just because of its uh because of its peripheral geographical peripheral uh, position um uh, in contrast uh, relative to a big city like patiala but also because uh, it, it it kind of encapsulates incorporates relationships uh, arrangements logics that are that kind of do not really fit into well fit well into this uh, urban dynamics of of when we talk about global cities or the world class cities uh, it has a strong agrarian character and 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 the consumption economy largely caters to the rural population uh, so i i i try and argue that patna's transformation has been driven by the historical and the very contemporary process of agrarian change that occurred in in the region in punjab and in in, in the patiala in the patiala region it was driven by the socio political changes that were happening in agriculture during the time of uh, firstly uh, from its transition uh, during the mass peasant movement that occurred in pepsu to end uh, to end tenancy uh, and then uh, it led to a state driven land reforms uh, and uh, leading to uh, to uh, the central strategy of green revolution to make agriculture prosperous uh, so yeah so that 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 kind of provided the initial initial trajectory to patna's urban transformation uh, so patna uh, so i i'd like to focus on one uh, key thing i use the conceptual uh, framework of peri- uh, of agrarian urbanism why because i i i i i argue that patna's transformation was driven by these by the by the by the way in which uh, land and kind of caste was transforming because of the agrarian changes uh, uh, occurring in the region uh, and this kind of agrarian changes it kind of encompasses uh, so urban 
the making of patna itself is a process of making and unmaking it it emerged as a huge agriculture hub in the 19 uh, in the 1950s and 60s because of the green revolution but post the 1990s uh, you see a stagnancy that also was kind of driven by the fact that agriculture sector began to kind of slow down so um, and 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 i argue that uh, my, this kind of agrarian changes encompasses experiences of communities their struggles their resistance their negotiations negotiation strategies so i i i kind of for example show which if and and some of these responses of these communities have been driven by agrarian changes by the uh, they kind of incorporate agrarian aspirations dreams as uh, dreams needs uh, uh, driven by the green revolution so i uh, so for example i show that in in the early periods of of the green revolution uh, jats the, the the regional dominant caste group when when it was kind of accumulating capital in the rural it is the hindu traders who brought in capital uh, who migrated to the town and 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 kind of got into trade and commerce uh, an essential part of the green revolution was to have these agro purchase centers as various at various villages patna was one such village where a agro purchase center was set up which brought in a lot of trade and commerce and it brought the brought the hindus the hindu trading caste the paniyas there into the town and and as the jats accumulated their position in the in the rural uh, the hindus kind of changed the social geography of they invested heavily in rice mills in in agro trading in agro inputs uh, also in uh, uh, significantly in the property sector now what we see is that we see there is a changing response of these communities as as stagnation begins to kind of set in agrarian agrarian because of the agrarian uncertainties the jats the jat sikhs who kind of take great pride in rurality in agrarian identity have have tried to now move beyond the rural are, are wanting to move beyond and have moved beyond the rural into the urban the bigger ones have been able to kind of invest heavily in property palatial houses the smaller ones have gotten into public sector jobs because of the historically dominant position in the in these in the state's administration now when you look at gujars that's that's another community uh it was a community that gained heavily during the land reforms uh uh where they were able to channelize their resource during the green revolution they were able to channelize their resources in buying more better quality land in nearby villages but uncertainties have enabled them to step into the urban non farm uh, sector they are now also work as they combine agriculture work with with the urban non farm wage work similarly hindus uh, the traders who primarily are the economic players uh, 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 kind of in the paddy wheat sector are also reinvesting their agrarian capital back into the rural so what we see here is that communities are kind of responding much of these changes that is happening in 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 this town is is because of the ways communities are responding to agrarian uncertainties and 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 this kind of change has not really kind of uh, Uh, withered the rural links uh, they continue to be tied to the rural uh, that's that's uh, that's a very important point this kind of urbanism has responded to changes in agriculture but has not kind of withered the rural uh, agrarian links so i think I, i'd like to end by raising i think this is a very important question that 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 we can raise is is india's urbanization kind of is responding to agrarian uncertainties because much of the changes in the agriculture sector have been spoken only within the domain of agrarian studies but urban is kind of responding to the uncertainties in the agriculture as well and can the agriculture sector be a be a very important safety net for the urban uh, yeah so i think i'll with this i think i'll i'll kind of end thank you <laughs> thank you so much ankita and uh, you know i think very insightful very insightful now over to you prati Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to uh, sort of speak in this panel, and I thank uh, the organizers for organizing this. Uh, so, I'm gonna uh, talk about my paper, which basically draws from my PhD thesis. Within my PhD thesis, I actually look at uh, brick kilns as a sort of specific mode of production, a specific site where uh, you have uh, certain relations. Uh, so, I. Uh, sort of capture the relation the specific relation to ecology that is constructed to brickens the specific relation of re reproductive practices and productive identities that are 
uh, sort of imminent within the Brickens. And within this paper, I have sort of tried to capture the specific relation to urbanity that sort of constructed through Brickens, the urbanity and processes of circular migration. Now, when I speak of the urban, I have to say that, you know, uh, one has to think of Brickkiln as Brickkiln clusters, because uh, there, there are also Brickkilns in the rural, there are also these kind of tiny, small uh, individual units that uh, cater to a rural demand. But what I, I actually probe is the kind of large clusters of, uh, you know, large scale Brickkilns that produce uh, maybe uh, like a one crore or two crore bricks in a season. And those are specifically a peri-urban phenomenon today. Those are, in fact, uh, one of my professors used to say that, you know, you could uh, be on a train and you would see the brickkins uh, arrive. Uh, you know, you'd be entering a city from the farms and you'd see the brickkins and you would kind of uh, get a clue to the city as being imminent as the boundaries of the city as coming, coming over. And uh, so to sort of talk about uh, the particular relation uh, in which Brickkins have to the urban. And within the paper, I sort of trace how Brickkins uh, that have now become this kind of peri-urban infrastructure were actually not peri-urban to begin with. So specifically in Delhi, uh, Brickkins were actually in the center of the city. If you relate uh, to the mode of sort of production, uh, the technology of Brickkins at that time, as well as the uh, uh, aspect of transporting these heavy bricks because bricks constitute a sort of heavy materiality. Uh, in fact, brickkins in uh, up till the 1960s, 70s used to be in in sort of the center of Delhi. So, uh, if you look at maps of Delhi in uh, 1890s, uh, you would see brickkins around uh, Chandni Chowk. You will see it in 1920s. You will see brickkins around Lutyens Delhi, and they would really be sort of concentrated along hubs of where construction was booming. And so then I sort of try to see the history of how Brickkins were sort of pushed out to the periphery. And here you sort of understand that uh, this process has been uh, sort of uh, evolved. So, so the first uh, major sort of colonial law that tried to push Brickens out to the periphery was in 1941. And during that time, the major concern for uh, Brickens within the city, on, aside from their sort of unsightly look, uh, was to was their impact on public health and specifically the incidence of malaria that was being caused because of the uh, holes that were dug in the ground from the extraction of soil. And then to sort of trace it through the 70s and the 80s and how that discourse shifted from malaria to air pollution I, in, a, in a way that we recognize now. And to sort of uh, capture this process of how Brickkins were shifted out of the city of Delhi and now to peri-urban villages 40, 50 kilometers away, uh, which, which happened through not a single process. It happened through uh, uh, particular court judgments like the uh, iconic MC Mehta judgment, uh, it happened through master plans. It happened through uh, sort of economic processes where uh, land became costly. Uh, but to sort of then question where was labor within this kind of displacement? Where was labor within this disposition of brickkins from the city to the peri-urban? And here you find the kind of curious uh, absence where uh, brickkins are always spoken of in a labor idiom, they're always spoken of in relation to, uh, you know, sites of modern slavery or, uh, you know, uh, sites of debt bondage and abuse. Uh, and, and in fact, Brickkins also heavily feature in parliamentary debates as a kind of uh, proxy for poverty or proxy for labor exploitation. But in actual processes of when these Brickkins were displaced, you have this kind of very non-specific uh, Laws around labor's welfare. Uh, to begin with, uh, you know, I won't go into detail. To begin with, in surveys after surveys, you find that the number of Brickkin workers were never properly recorded. So, uh, in 1954, the Brickkin Owner Association that wanted to showcase 
how important it was as a owner uh, as a community stated that they have th- they employ 30000 workers in delhi that's in 1934 and uh, 1954 in 1988 when delhi uh, government was asked in a parliamentary question how many workers uh, and how many brickens exist in delhi they reply there are 388 brickens with 25000 workers which doesn't make sense because not only have the uh, number of workers decreased but also that averages out to 64 workers in a single brick kiln which even if you take for account the uncounting of women and children uh, that happens in labor statistics, even if you take just the number of males, that is not a realistic uh, amount of uh, number that can actually sustain a, a, a major producing brick kiln in a city like Delhi. So we, I sort of process, uh, uh, try to sort of uh, collect all these uh, archival uh, resources to sort of try to understand how historically labor has been situated in this move uh, within Brickens. And then I sort of take it to the present. And in the present, what you'll find uh, in a contemporary moment, uh, this sort of historical process was brought about by the air pollution uh, crisis. So uh, in 2019, when I was doing field work, uh, the graded uh, action plan uh, for uh, controlling air pollution, which was sort of, uh, which sort of becomes an emergency measure every winter. Uh, And in fact, it it was in existence uh, in years prior to it. Suddenly in the year of my fieldwork became a major policy discourse and was suddenly uh, imposed with a stringency uh, that wasn't uh, present in previous years. And I could see, uh, you know, the deep crisis that followed because Brickens are a specific site where uh, where there is a conflation or sort of the interlocking of production and reproduction, reproduction space. So workers actually stay in the Brickens and work there for eight months. And there's also the relation of debt bondage. So uh, idle time or time where you're not producing does not only produce wagelessness or the lack of wage, but it also actively translates to debt it actively translates to the debt that you had already received and that is accumulating in your name. And so within that intersection, I could actually find the, uh, the contemporary process of how uh, the protection of Delhi's air created a deep crisis when these brickings were suddenly shut down for three months and workers had to you know, just stay in the kiln and uh, you know, let the debt accumulate, and they had a really bad season in 2019. And uh, so, so that's one process by which, uh, in the paper, I look at uh, brickins and and its relation to urbanity. But then there is a further process where I think of uh, periurban as sort of this relational uh, labor-centered discourse, and to think of how. The periphery is constructed also by is also embodied and sort of constructed by the these devalorized migrants migrant circulations between the brickins and other spots. So specifically, I focused on uh, you know circular migration between the brickins and the city. And what I found out, um, you know, basically this this emerged from me collecting a lot of life histories of Brickin workers during my field work, where I sort of asked, you know, in different years, where have you been, you know, and and you would find that uh, all of these Brickin workers had really sort of fascinating stories. They have worked in uh, farm uh, farming in one year. They have worked in, uh, you know, be, been a truck driver in another year. They have been, they have tried to sort of assemble an urban livelihood in one year. And even seasonally, you know, they they uh, leave the brick, they uh, walk in the brickens for eight months. But in the remaining four months, they may work in uh, specific construction sites. They may work as a rickshaw driver in, uh, you know, Azad Nagar, or they may uh, go back to Bihar and uh, the Bihar and Bilaspur, where all all the brickin workers I interviewed were from, and work as uh, you know either construction workers or. Uh, agriculture workers. And so to, in sort of tracing these migration, I tried to find out 
what were the main sort of sources through which uh, Brickian, uh, you know, circularity was constituted. And so uh, without going into detail, I sort of found out that, uh, you know, one of them was about managing bodily damage. So, uh, you know, Brickians have a, a specific mode of work uh, versus uh, which, which is really tiring and really long work, but it is not hazardous. Uh, and so there is this kind of like managing body, bodily strain through, um, through uh, juggling between different kinds of work. Uh, there's also this uh, very interesting question of sociality. So most of Brickian workers, you would find they migrate with their families, but they're also mostly, uh, you know, these families are uh, the sort of the center, the head of the household is the middle-aged uh, male. And uh, and what you'd usually find in terms of male, male migrant labor circulation is that 18-year-old boys or 16-year-old boys they grow up in Brickens. They have had no education because they, they've been migrating with their parents to the Brickens since they were children. But at the age of 16, the regimented uh, sort of life of the Brickens becomes too constraining for them. And they move out to seek factory work. They move out to do all these other kinds of work. And then they return to the Brickens at the age of 30 when they want to keep family close. So the, all these discourses, you know, uh, for example, a, a, a young person says that you know you become dark skinned uh, when you become when you work in the Brickins. like I don't feel like working here. Uh, I don't get smart when I work in a Brickin, and so I sort of try to uh, you know look at the urban and other sites of work where uh, you know where an, an escape is sought, and then when you look at people who are in their 30s, they sort of don't want to, they don't want, uh, you know, the kind of translocal households where, you know, you're hearing about a crisis from your family through the phone. And if you want to keep your family close, then you, then it's one of the major reasons that you would migrate to a brick kiln. So broadly, uh, I, I'm almost running out of time. So broadly, I look at uh, brick kilns in the frame of uh, this kind of space where um, uh, there is a devaluation of labor, uh, and uh, and I also look at Brickins both in relation to uh, Vinay Gidwani's work of the infra economy, which speaks of um, you know a, a, a space that has been denied recognition by state and civil society, but is also critical to the production of urban space. Uh, and I also look at, uh, and also sort of related to Sital Chabria's work as the peripheries of urban uh, cities not being bound in space alone, but in the bodies uh, and circulations of migrant workers. Uh, so generally, I sort of combine these two, uh, you know, both contemporary patterns of uh, circular migration and mobility, uh, as contemporary processes of uh, urban uh, privileging or, or, or urban impact on brick kilns, uh, which is sort of uh, instantiated through the air pollution crisis in Delhi and the historical process of how brick kilns were moved out of, of Delhi to sort of eclectically uh, comprise this process to uh, understand brick kilns in relation to urbanity and sort of raise questions about uh, uh, peripheral urbanization as both, uh, you know, impl implicated in the transformation of uh, urban hinterlands uh, as industrial spaces, and also implicated within the kind of uh, circular uh, migration trajectories of uh, certain and various segments of labor. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pratik. I think just a really valuable and much needed labor lens on uh, the peri urban. And now I'd like to invite Ruby, who's going to give us a very, I think, very, very valuable, again, uh, you know, comparative perspective, looking at the Indian and the Chinese spaces. And so over to you, Ruby. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be try to be brief. <laughs> so my research project uh, presented in the article um, in the special issue or, originates from my observation, observation that 
observation in China and in India that in the peripheries of the metropolitan regions, uh, both established the new residents of uh, various kinds of uh, uh, ethnic, religion, religious, linguistic, region, regional backgrounds uh, inhabit common, common residential spaces, which I refer as uh, residential cohabitation. So in this paper, uh, which is sort of uh, explore, exploratory work, I, I intended to study these, kind of, these patterns of uh, urban relationalities that emerge uh, between different social groups that cohabit in the urban peripheries in China and India, particularly in conjunction with the evolving uh, built environment in the peripheries. And uh, to do so, I, I juxtapose uh, selected, selected sites uh, from the peripheries of uh, Chengdu in China and Hyderabad in India. So the two mega cities that uh, actively engage in the uh, strategies uh, uh, to position themselves in the uh, global, uh, globalizing projects. So um, inspired by the kind of work on urban assemblages, I, uh, and also uh, Massey's notion of uh, coexisting heterogeneities, I, I deploy the concept of uh, assemblage of living together to show uh, how in the wider context of social economic change taking place in these different uh, peripheral sites, new configurations, new kind of new configurations of sociality or uh, new assemblages of living together um, emerge alongside this kind of constantly changing built environment. I wanted to uh, particularly focus on this kind of uh, co-production and co-evolution of uh, uh, social relationality and uh, the forms of built environments. So, um, so then I will introduce like the kind of the three kind of uh, uh, configurations of uh, residential cohabitation I identified that is uh, common in both uh, Hyderabad and Chengdu. The first one is this kind of uh, interspersion of uh, gated communities and auto-constructed communities. Um, in, in China would be uh, urban villages and in, in India would be the, uh, uh, these kind of villages near, uh, near the peripheries or, uh, or Basti, uh, et cetera. And this kind of uh, interspersion is particularly characterized by geographical proximity and uh, at the same time physical separation, often marked by uh, physical boundaries such as walls, uh, gates, green, green belts and white streets that is uh, erected by the planning bureaus or residents them themselves. And these kind of uh, physical boundaries uh, demarcate the territories of the residential communities. And the second kind of uh, uh, Cohab uh, cohabitation I identified is a kind of internal heterogeneities that uh, and separate living of different social, ethnic, and religious uh, and regional groups within the same residential, uh, residential areas, be it uh, gated community or uh, auto construction, uh, auto constructed communities. I found that uh, just not only the auto constructed communities have different groups of uh, villagers. Uh, and incoming migrants living together. Uh, for example, I, I, I focused on this uh, evolving uh, relation, relations between the, uh, between the uh, buffalo, buffalo, buffalo um, herders and uh, the, uh, the farmers in one uh, village near, uh, near the um, uh, financial district around Hyderabad. And, and, in addition, in this, in all this, in this kind of gated communities in the uh, around uh, around uh, Hyderabad and Chengdu's uh, urban peripheries, they are also very heterogeneous along the lines of uh, ethnicity, religion, and nationality. Also along the lines of uh, homeowners and uh, the, along the lines of divide between homeowners and renters. And the third kind of uh, uh, configuration of cohabitation I identified is this kind of vertical cohabitation uh, within the 
auto constructed rental housing in the uh, in the villages in Chengdu and in Hyderabad. So in this kind of uh, auto constructed multi story rental housing on, owned by the villagers, uh, this kind of cohabitation pattern is often that the villager landlords live at the ground floor and the renters occupy the upper floors. And the spatial patterns of living at different floors, on one hand, separate the living and socializing spaces of landlords and renters, at the same time, also allowing the landlords managing and surveilling the activities of the migrant renters. So within these three uh, configurations of living together, uh, I, I argue that, that two types of rel relationalities emerged alongside with the uh, evolving uh, built environment. Uh, and each, of, each kind of relationality has its own paradox. So the first kind of relationality is this uh, absence of social interaction despite uh, geographical proximity. So different social groups are uh, physically proximate in all three uh, uh, configurations of uh, living together. Uh, they socialize separately according to norms. And these kind of norms often uh, materialize as physical boundaries, such as walls and green belts and white roads and different floors of buildings. And the second kind of uh, social relationality is kind of unequal relation of interdependence. So, so certain, I discovered that certain forms of economic interdependence uh, occur between different social groups in the urban peripheries, uh, particularly the kind of employment relations between the residents of uh, elite gated communities and residents of auto-constructed communities. And on the other hand, the uh, landlord-tenant relations uh, within the auto-constructed communities. Uh, however, this kind of, uh, this kind of economic interdependence doesn't uh, lead to further uh, social uh, solidarity. I, I found that uh, this kind of uh, dependence is really based on unequal interactions, uh, particularly expressed through uh, the attitudes or kind of discrimination towards certain groups of people, um, particularly uh, migrant workers and migrant tenants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yubi. Uh, and now over to you, uh, Shubra. Thank you so much, Ashima. I just wanted to mention that Ashima also has a paper in the collection, um, which she has uh, agreed to not speak about in the, uh, in the uh, to give us more time. Uh, so uh, I'll not take much time. I've given myself six minutes. Um, the, it was wonderful to listen to all the papers, even though one has read them before. So thank you for your presentations. And once again, uh, thanks to IMPRI uh, for uh, giving us the platform to host this session, and especially to uh, Samaj for their very uh, you know, uh, what do you call efficient uh, reviewing process and very quick delivery on this. So please, Lorraine, convey our uh, gratitude for their uh, uh, job very well done. So thanks again. In my presentation, I don't really have a presentation. I have scribbled notes here and there, and that is the pleasure of going last, uh, that you can scribble them at the end. Uh, one of the questions which has been raised uh, here in the on all the papers and by uh, Ashima and Lorraine as well, uh, why the periphery? I mean, what is it about the periphery and how we think about the periphery? And we, of course, build on a large and growing body of scholarship, which is uh, now talking about the peri peripheral turn, the peri-urban literature. And as Lorraine mentioned, that we adopt a very capacious understanding of periphery, which is not geographically situated. But one of the things which uh, all the papers talk about is that it's about the kind of the that periphery as a generative space for us, both to intervene in urban theory and also to thinking about urban policy, that periphery as a particular kind of site, a particular kind of uh, volatile, highly contested, and, and a very uneven terrain to think about thinking about the space called the urban. And when we think about the place called the urban, we actually found 
that the Lefebvre concept of co-production, as Lorraine mentioned, to be highly, highly productive for us. And the co-production of space, uh, politics, and practice, which we bring together in conversation with uh, uh, Doreen Massey's work on co-production of space and subject. And now, what is co-production? Again, about as Lubing just talked about, and as did uh, Pratik and uh, Ankita and Carol and uh, Ashima in their papers, are really about the question of relationality, the relational constructedness of these peripheries, and to thinking about heterogeneities. And in fact, this is what our collection has done, is to bring out very different dynamics, which are both at the simultaneously local, regional, and has a host of actors, both uh, national and global. And something which comes out in the peripheries for us is the un incomplete nature of it, of, of constantly being in, in making, as we call it in our, our introduction, as a kind of places in making and place making exercises, which are quite uh, interesting for researchers to think about what is it about the peripheries that brings out. So when we're thinking of peripheries, we are thinking in relational terms. And here, of course, relation between the city and the periphery, but as Ankita pointed out, what is in the context of India, which is still predominantly agrarian, it's the relation, relation between simultaneous, uh, simultaneous co-production of urbanization and de-agrarianization, which is taking place, and the contemporary farmers' movements that is uh, gripped the uh, uh, gripped India right now is precisely an enunciation of some of the anxieties, the tensions, which are reworking the politics of land, politics of caste, of, uh, uh, of uh, government uh, interventions. And of course, something which came out in the papers was the ways in which the uh, relationship between social groups, as Lubing points out and Carol points out and all the, and so does all the papers is the of, of the question of caste. It's, it's highly enhanced, which was, it works along with class and then to show the, uh, throw the light on the changing dynamics of caste and how property classes and property castes are re getting reorganized is urging us to rethink what can the, the processes of urbanization in the Indian context can help us think about urban theory at large, which has had different lenses and vectors to think about. But as we think about uh, the question of co-production, of course, the challenge is the question of how. Uh, how, how do, do we study the co-production uh, of these spaces and subjectivities and politics? And that takes me to the uh, question of methodology and the question of, uh, how do an uh, urban actually calls for a particular kind of a multimodal approach to thinking about uh, collecting data? How do we study the space, something which is incomplete, something which is as always under construction, something, and as we all know, if you go to some place like Gurgaon, where I go to do, where I do my field work, it looks different every time. I don't have my uh, you know, spots finally uh, firmly located. The landscape looks different. The maps look, look different. Boundaries look different. What does it mean then to do field work or collect data in such kind of highly volatile, highly dynamic uh, spaces? And here the question of adopting a range of research methodologies, which all our papers do, of course, uh, about ethnographic research, qualitative research, quantitative work, oral histories, archives become a rich repertoire for to draw from. But I also think we need to think more about doing different kinds of and more innovative kind of field work with it and data collection, perhaps thinking through visual methodologies, thinking through uh, other ways of archiving and documenting a dynamic changing space. And that's a question I leave it open to the panel and to the attendees to think about how actually can we map something which is constantly changing. And this is a question for anthropologists, how to map uh, space and time, which is not stable, but trans constantly transforming. And here we, I think it requir requires us to also reflect on the mu multidisciplinary approach to the study of the urban what are the, uh, the pitfalls and the possibilities that it may open uh, for us. And I think here, when I think about the multimodal, multidisciplinary approach to the urban and rethink the urban from the global south, I'm 
thinking about the challenge of comparison and what does the comparative gesture mean? Uh, and I think our papers have that. Ashima's paper brings uh, Hyderabad and Noida into question. And I think all of us have thought about it and Lubing much more directly is thinking about this. And again, we need to think about what can this kind of situated uh, understanding of the periphery contribute to the growing debate in comparative urbanism? What are the possibilities and precisely from a place, uh, from the perif uh, peripheral locations? The other question which we have uh, thought about was the question of scaling it up. That is about forging, uh, forging conversations beyond India, taking it to, for instance, to China and beyond, to thinking about uh, the ways in which the space of the periphery can allow us to think about urban theory itself and re, as we thought about initially was revisit some of the core categories of, uh, of the urban, which are tended to dominate urban theory. And finally, I just, these are a bunch of questions which we have, and I think uh, uh, some of these have also been uh, uh, mentioned in a shoe phase uh, afterward for, to our, uh, uh, afterward to our uh, special issue. But, uh, and I think, what are the possibilities and limits and what are the blind spots as she mentions and what can be brought, what can be offered in terms of thinking through multidisciplinary approaches and how can this work can be taken up outside of uh, India and South Asia and beyond. And finally, one word I wanted to say about collaboration and uh, having just finished this with Lorraine and Ashima, I just wanted to say that there is something to learn about collaborative research. And it was a pleasure to work with an, an economist, a political scientist and anthropologist coming together and bringing our, uh, you know, uh, uh, different uh, disciplinary trainings and thinking in uh, common ways and to uh, re energize the debate on uh, urban theory and urban uh, policies possibly. And that's what I think is there is a possibility to take this forward. And, um, and on that note, I will just uh, uh, open the uh, forum for further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Subra. I think you sort of brought together the, uh, you know, themes and the discussion uh, beautifully. And, you know, I see that there's already a question uh, here in the chat. And, you know, it uh, addresses all of us to a degree, but then also specifically to Liu Bing, I think. Uh, so I think the question is uh, first, and Lorraine, maybe you might want to take this. Uh, this is from Professor Sheila Prashad, of course, uh, from University of Hyderabad. And she says, how would subaltern urbanization complicate the narratives of peripheral urbanization? And uh, how is peripheral urbanization uh, different from our part of subaltern urbanization? Uh, and then, of course, Lubing, there's also a question uh, to you about how is it that, uh, you know, these two places are comparable because the governance and social structures uh, you know, in the two settings are quite different. Yeah, I'm happy to take the first part. Thank you very much, Sheila, for, um, for posing this question because uh, it gives me a chance to clarify um, this important research on subaltern urbanization that's um, been undertaken. You know, I'm thinking of, you know, French colleagues and Indian colleagues who have uh, been working on this um, in the last 10 years, um, you know, this, this is really the heart of what we're, we're talking about, in fact, you know, subaltern urbanization is uh, very much about peripheral uh, kind of processes, you know, uh, away from metropolitan areas. And, and I think we all learned a lot from, from that scholarship, you know, about, um, about this idea that you know, globalization is not only happening in metropolitan cities, you know, that, that uh, small settlements are engaged with the global uh, in, in, in different ways. And, um, and that there's a lot of kind of endogenous sort of things happening. And likewise, you know, what, what we're also mobilizing the work on agrarian urbanism, you know, we're sort of pooling all this and trying to build on this, this body of, of work over the last you know, 10 years or, or so. And, and uh, so, no, it's very much part of that. Um, and I think we're all learning, you know, from, from this research. So I'll let, um, I'll let you, Bing, uh, answer more specifically this, this question about Chengdu and Hyderabad. 
Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Sheila. Um, so um, I, I think like it's to do kind of a comparative work between China and, and India in, in really is very challenging. And uh, uh, what I did in this project is really like to, to find the um, common commonalities between the, uh, between the two, two, uh, two sites in the urban peripheries. And, and there, there are a lot. So I feel like there may be in some other some, some other aspects like um, particular, some other aspects like social protests or social movement there 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 are a lot of uh, differences in terms of that but like I find the very uh, there there is like very key um, commonality I can really put uh, Chengdu in dialogue with Hydra but in this kind of uh, uh, intersection of uh, uh, kind of a globalization. Uh, the kind of a, a project of a, a very very strong state initiative to uh, globalize the the city the urban peripheries and which interacts interacts with various different kinds of um, local conditions uh, local uh, norms and customs um, this is like the key uh, I, the, the kind of the uh, axis that I used to compare Chengdu and China to, to have a little bit more, to, to put it more precisely that uh, in Chengdu, we have this, like in the urban periphery where, where I went for field work, there had, there is this global, uh, this, this uh, globalizing, I would say globalizing project to, to build this um, uh, kind of global uh, tourist destination to have this uh, like a, a, a theme park uh, very uh, like Western uh, modeled after some Western theme park, the kind of a huge theme park, and also uh, a, a set of uh, high-end gated communities to attract uh, the class to, to, to live there. And in, in Hyderabad, of course, we have this Cyberabad, uh, uh, and then the uh, the financial district that is uh, to host the. Uh, global uh, global um, global uh, companies and uh, and uh, then this kind of project intersects with these uh, rural uh, rural communities and and this is this this kind of intersection is uh, what I find really uh, comparable in uh, both in Chengdu and uh, in Chengdu and Hyderabad. Thanks so much. I think that, I mean, I, I certainly see a lot of uh, I think value in this this comparative gesture. Maybe Shubhra, since you did mention this, you might want to add a little bit more uh, about specifically the comparison between the Chinese case uh, and, of course, the Indian case. And I think the comparison of these two particular cities, Chengdu and Hyderabad, is particularly very valuable because exactly as you've been saying, you know, there is uh, the state initiative and then, you know, the private action along with it. Ashima, there are some questions in the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, let me just read them out. Would you like to respond to this at all, uh, Shura, this particular question? Uh, or should we just uh, perhaps move on, take all the questions, and then maybe we can come back and answer uh, all of them together. Uh, so we see, I see that there is, a, you know, a, an anonymous attendee saying that, you know, there are lots of new things uh, for somebody outside uh, of urban studies. And they ask, could engaging the urban from the periphery also include areas of study on urbanization that are on the margins and intersections, right? And I think it's uh, worth thinking about what, what are the margins and what are the intersections? And what are the tangible impacts of such research and inquiry? And how does the pandemic affect the discussion and the approach? On this? And I think this is also a methodological question. Uh, so I think this is definitely one that perhaps all of us have been engaging with rather grappling with in our various ways. And I think, uh, you know, there should be a lot of insight uh, from, from all of us to be able to speak to this question. Uh, I see also a question from uh, Ram Mohan uh, Chitta, who's worked with us on many of our projects. Uh, and uh, Ram Mohan says, uh, 
I have an interest in understanding forceful peripheral rehousing of the poor, right? And I think this is a very important uh, phenomenon that, to a degree, you know, um, some of us have addressed uh, in in our papers. Uh, uh, and so he says, on the other hand, I'm also exploring aspirational migrants who settle on the periphery within auto-constructed spaces to participate in the growing economy of the SEZs or the gig economic opportunities. And so how should scholars engage with the impact of capital uh, as a force uh, in shaping these contrasting aspirational and forced peripheral communities? And I think this uh, you know, really goes to the heart also of you know, some of what uh, Liu Bing was describing, right? Sort of these typologies of cohabitation. Uh, so um, perhaps Shubhra, you might want to start, or Lorraine, if you might want to set, get us started and then I'll you know, turn it over to our contributors. Um, well, I'm happy to chime in uh, quickly. Um, thank you for these questions. Um, the, the first one, let's see, uh, it just disappeared. Uh, there it is. Uh, yes, okay, so Pratik has, has offered already a, a, a start of, a, of an answer. I would just like to say that, that um, our idea of periphery, again, as a kind of a conceptual category, um, is, is definitely compatible with looking at margins of all kinds, you know, e even, you know, marginality uh, within uh, urbanized spaces. Uh, the whole idea was to try to move away from a, a kind of a fixed uh, uh, spatial category and really think about what margins and, and peripheries can, can tell us about, um, you know, urbanization more, more broadly. So, so yes, definitely, that, that's part of it. Um, someone I else want to come in? I think relates to what you, uh, the question just being raised about uh, housing is uh, Ratula. Hi, Ratula uh, has asked a question. Um, if I uh, uh, wanted to ask if we are continuing to draw a distinct spatial and administrative boundaries between the city and the periphery through our work on peripheral urbanization. And I think that's an important question that are we actually uh, resuscitating the idea of what a city is by focusing only on the uh, periphery. Uh, what do we have to say about urbanization and how we conceptualize a city also as a process? I think crucial questions. Uh, I think when we, I mean, the reason for, uh, and I think important, and I think it really is the, when uh, we started thinking about the peripheries, it was not something which is outside of the uh, city or something which is not related to the city, but in fact, thinking about the dynamic Relation, uh, relations between the city and the, its outside as part of the RC21 theme, or thinking beyond the city and, and thinking of urban itself as not only within the city, but urban that exceeds, exceeds the city and into the rural, into the hinterlands, and in fact is uh, co-constituted through these processes. So in that sense, yes, uh, these are not clearly demarcated but relationally produced spaces. And uh, so absolutely city and urban and peripheries are not distinct, but uh, highlighting the role of these peripheries or these in the policy circle spaces that are kept thought of as non-urban or as peripheral to the urban, to br bringing them center stage, to be thinking about how the urban and particularly in the context of uh, India, in, uh, the rural, uh, gets uh, um, to be co-produced uh, and is constitutive of the urban and of the city. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that is not certainly to revive or to uh, reinscribe the uh, distinction between the city and the periphery, but to highlight the relationality. So that's, I don't know, uh, Lorraine and Ashima, if you want to pitch in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would want to speak to, uh, you know, two sets of, uh, I think, questions that have come up. And I, I do see a link between, you know, the point that Ratula is making, you know, Champaka is also asking about, you know, these exclusionary forms of urban governance that we are seeing uh, emerge 
you know, and also I think uh, Ram Mohan's point about, you know, uh, you know, the forced as well as the aspirational forms of, you know, peripheral uh, urbanization and, you know, uh, urban uh, habitation. Uh, I think the, the point that sort of connects all of these, and I sort of think very much in terms of concrete places, right? And I think about concrete examples. And it seems to me that, um, you know, the, the, the city as a process, Rajula, to think about, you know, specifically, you know, that that set of questions around, you know, what is the city as a process? Um, you know, certainly in Hyderabad, one of the interesting things that we see over a period of time is, uh, you know, looking at how the municipal boundaries have changed. And certainly in my own paper, I see the municipal boundary as a pretty core characteristic of what we uh, describe as, uh, you know, the, the central city versus what we might call the periphery. Right, and the periphery is in fact a place of shifting governance arrangements. That is what defines the periphery in relation to the upper. Right, that is what demarcates it. Uh, but over a period of time, one of the interesting things that you know we see when we sort of trace the growth of even the Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation, you know, uh, which was set up in 2007, 2008, and of course, Lorraine has written a lot about this. Uh, is that, you know, uh, it's been a process of this sort of dynamic absorption and, you know, uh, inclusion of municipalities on the boundaries, right, that leads to sort of the expansion of the city. Uh, and uh, I certainly think that we have not paid enough attention to forms of government, right, uh, you know, uh, whether it is, you know, uh, as uh, Champakra is correctly saying, you know, all of these sort of uh, special specialized forms of government, you know, the uh, you know, public sector corporations that are sort of uh, serving as uh, essentially the de facto government in many of these areas, whether you look at the Noida Authority or you look at large parts of Hyderabad. Uh, I, when I started looking at this data, I was really surprised to see that there are a large number of census towns, uh, you know, that are demarcated. They do not have a statutory government, but they do have these specialized forms of government, right? Uh, and they are all, you know, above, they are very substantial in size, just like Noida, right? Noida is like some, I think, you know, a, you know, sort of very, very large and very, very significant population centers, which do not have a municipal government, right? And so there is, this is very much, you know, part of the, um, I think, urbanization process, but also, uh, you know, the process of urban growth, we know that migration contributes very little to urban growth in India. And it's really sort of this transformation of spaces from, you know, uh, being rural to being coming to be defined as urban. And in that, implicated in that process is also, you know, what Gopa uh, Samantha has talked about, the unacknowledged urbanization. And that's something that I think we should be paying a lot more attention to. And I think that also connects very much to what Ram Mohan is saying about, you know, the aspirational, uh, you know, urban development, right, of the SEZ. And, uh, you know, all of these gated communities that you being has been describing, uh, that leads the way, but then that those also become the nodes of new kinds of informal, and I think of these as really the market forces of urban growth, right? Uh, so I think that there's definitely a connection and there is a process implicated there. And, you know, it's really over time, once you start paying attention that you can actually trace the process. Uh, not just in these particular case studies, but hopefully uh, in many other settings as well. And, you know, of course, uh, it would be very interesting to hear from, uh, certainly, uh, you know, Carol might want to say something about this and how this process has played out in uh, Bangalore. Yeah, can I jump in here? Yes, absolutely, Carol, yeah. please do. Yeah, um, no, I... Yeah. Please go ahead. Please I know, I just wanted to I add, add to that. Add questions. Yes, Carolyn, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to add briefly to this point about the boundaries um, and governance. That um, in the Bangalore case, um, the villages, when we selected them, we were not being very purposive about location. It more had to do with the location of real estate projects. But um, it turned out that one village was located just inside the municipal boundary and one was just outside. 
And we came to realize um, quite quickly that, you know, you, that, you know, that was the main thing that really differentiated how the land markets were working because different rules apply, right? Whether you're inside the municipal boundary or you're outside and you're still governed by the revenue department. And in Bangalore, it was called the Green Belt. Um, and so almost everything else flowed from that difference. And so I also became interested in this question of contestations around administrative boundaries where in Bangalore, every time they decide to redraw the master or the, you know, the um, revise the master plan, there are all kinds of, you know, political contestations around which villages get included and which don't. And that all has to do again with who owns land and land politics and the rest of it. So I'm just reinforcing this point that, you know, we need to pay a lot more attention to these governance structures, but also to the politics that produce them, um, especially on the edges of cities. Can I just uh, respond to yeah, carry on yeah, yeah. conversation? Okay, uh, Lorraine, why don't you go ahead? No, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, I mean, I'm, uh, thank you Ch Champakai for your paper, uh, her qu question and also to Ratula's uh, question that, you know, I think in terms of thinking about the question of governance uh, and what are the shifting uh, and the contested uh, terrain of governance is, Conceptually, we can argue and we can analyze that, but the challenge which Ratula is pointing out is actually real in terms of what, how do we actually map it? How do we capture the contestations and what kind of research methodologies we need to adopt? And it has to be a very different kind of research approach in terms of a slow research, a very slow grounded uh, everyday uh, nature of research is what it calls for. And if you want to understand the local level politics of caste, of class, of land, of uh, access, of exclusion, of segregation, uh, and it's subtle, it's not something which can be captured often through um, numbers may actually be helpful only to a certain extent. And that may be that the multidisciplinary approach to thinking about this kind of constructedness would be very useful to, uh, while the slow ethnographic uh, research in mapping the constructedness of boundaries and the blurring of these boundaries and the contestations can be captured at the everyday level to ethnographic work, uh, scaling it up requires a different kind of uh, lens to bringing it outside and hence thinking through comparativeness uh, would be a way to capture precisely what you're saying in terms of how they're maintained, by whom, who are the range of actors who come into play and how are the uh, local histories and uh, politics of domination uh, inform these uh, boundaries and how they get uh, reinscribed every now and then as we know they do. And to the question which uh, 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 Jampaka has raised, I don't know how they've gone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the two sets of uh, things going on. Yeah, and I think exactly uh, as you say, Champaka, that um, how would how 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 would one interpret privatized large scale infrastructure projects such as privatized airports, etc., uh, and the relationship to cities and their economies, but remain peripheral in their exclusionary governance models? And I think that's again into this, at least from my point of view as an anthropologist, uh, to thinking around the role of a range of actors and the local level, regional level dynamics and politics is crucial to figuring this out that how, even though, and I think uh, Pratik's paper on the Brickkins is that kind of story, that on the one hand, they are peripheral and exclusionary yet are constitutive and central and uh, of the urban. And I think that's a kind of a exercise which we have to, it's a question of documenting, we can conceptualize it, but the challenge is methodological in my view. Yeah, I just wanted to make one quick point. I, first off, thank you for these very, uh, very provocative questions that really, I think, go to the heart of, of what we're, you know, what we're trying to, to do um, in this work on, on peripheral urbanization. Um, you know, these spaces are, are characterized by, uh, by their, their high degree of fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation, whether you're talking about, you know, socio-spatial or institutional. And, and so, you know, th th this idea that, um, you know, you have these overlapping uh, governance regimes, uh, land tenure regimes, um, 
regulations, you have you know gaps and uh, alongside overlap. So, so you know, this is really part of, of the, the challenge of working on these spaces, but also uh, it is very central to what explains uh, what's happening there, whether you're talking about why uh, the huge, uh, you know, peripheral housing complexes, you know, for, for um, resettlement uh, purposes to some degree, I think that Ram Mohan is referring to, but also, you know, Champaka, uh, you know, these, these large infrastructure projects on the peripheries in part because you know the their uh, regulatory uh, no man's land, and you can fix uh, special rules uh, uh, and that kind of thing. So this is really it speaks to the heart of, of what we're we're working on. Uh, I don't want to be too long. I know time is is uh, precious. Yes, over to you, Dr. Rajin Kumar. Thank you. Let me also ask a few questions related to the subject only. And but first of all, let me congratulate uh, all of you for uh, being so candid and also taking so many of questions. Uh, one thing I really wanted to ask all of you that uh, as cities are growing, especially in the south, uh, south south as as really has been highlighted by the editors also, and we are looking also uh, from the lower middle income countries, be it China, India, all the south south. And we know how the process moves on. And uh, uh, it, it's quite some time, quite few decades, we have the experiences. Uh, what has been the global experiences that how it can be avoided? I'm asking this again because <clears throat> the, what the experience in India or be it in China also, we see that as, as the city is expanding, there are also small cities adding, but the bigger cities are you know just bulging. And uh, we have for those cities, greater name any city development authority, so many of parastatal or SPB is coming on. So we see over time there is gentrification or there is also vacancy, uh, ghost towns, whatnot. But we, we see in the matter of five years, 10 years, 15 years, everything gets filled up. So how do you see these processes and land prices, other things also, you know, keep changing. In India, we really, uh, uh, have a very tough time on the land issue. China has been able to make some mark uh, uh, from there also integrating the regional uh, economic activities also. And we really highlighted the point of uh, from being an agrarian economy to again, you know, just becoming a city and uh, a, a very different kind of city uh, uh, really led by, and uh, I think Ankita Ma'am also highlighted on the real estate property market, how it is changing and becoming exclusionary. So what would be the way forward towards that, looking at the experiences so that we, we move towards the inclusionary and sustainable urbanization. And uh, also uh, as the point has been also highlighted, is there any metrics? Uh, because most of the things are also coming very qualitative. Uh, any metrics in your view, which should be take, uh, uh, considered going forward for the urbanization. And uh, uh, on the point of pandemic also, let me also add that all the countries are focusing on capital and infrastructure push. And uh, there is again so much of thrust on uh, urbanization to lead the growth. So how do you see this phenomena going on? Do you see that uh, the topic which we are deliberating today, uh, what would be your response to that? And we can also move to a uh, way forward round or whoever panelists would like to take that. On the policy part also, I, I just, I'm just skipping that because all countries are focusing from last one, two decade on these issues, but not much movement there. We have the urban mission and all. Shubha ma'am, would you like to reflect upon any of these? Uh, Dr. Kumar, I think we need another panel for this. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you raised a whole lot of questions for us. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is where, I know, as uh, at least as researchers are, uh, what we see our roles as to identifying the problem, uh, we leave the solutions to the policymakers. Uh, but nonetheless, having said that, the question of the challenge of urbanization and how we think about it is, you know, uh, of course, witnessing us in a con in a, the scale and the pace of change in the global south uh, is unprecedented and has had uh, significant impacts on both social, ecological, political, and economic dimensions. And we're, it's unraveling and we do not know how it will unfold. Having said that, it is, uh, we know what the forces are. We know who 
sort of the big actors are, the role of the state, uh, the role of capital, uh, the changing role of labor, and uh, is some of the key actors and its kind of uh, impact is we, we know. So I think the big question comes, what is the way in which we can rethink state, how we can rethink governance? Uh, and the biggest question is how can we think the nature of capitalist urbanization? Uh, I mean, that is what is facing us right now. And perhaps the, for us to understand, to arrive at solutions, I think we need to first identify what really are the problems and what is what exactly, especially in the context of climate change, what does sustainability mean? I mean, the sustainable de development goals, which the UN has put forward, they become pretty tokenistic beyond a point. And if we really need to think about the challenges which capitalist urbanization forces, faces is that we think about alternatives to capitalism. So having said that, it's what does it mean? And it takes us down to the question of, uh, questions of rethinking the state, rethinking the politics of labor, and the rethinking uh, governance. So only then can we arrive at some kind of a meaningful understanding of sustainability and sustainability for whom, for what, and for what kind of future. So I think it's a big question. It's a question of how we are, how we are envisioning our future and who's envisioning for us. I mean, um, and I think this is a debate which is raging right now. And I think um, answers are not there on that pessimistic note. Great. Yes, so uh, Dr. Kumar, anything else? Or maybe we should, you know, uh, move forward and sort of wrap up the discussion. I think uh, we are past our time. And, you know, I think uh, certainly for all of us here, it's, you know, getting late. But uh, we, we can have a way forward round from all the panelists. One yes, yes, on the topic. absolutely. Absolutely. So okay. please go ahead. Uh, you we'll know, I think. First. Yeah, Ashima, I'm up to you. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think let's. I think I would certainly like to hear from the contributors first, and uh, you know, maybe uh, Carol would like to go first. Uh, maybe Ankita, uh, you know, where do we go forward from the discussion, the debate that we've had here today, uh, and you know, both in policy terms and in terms of you know this peripheral peripheral turn in urban strategy, right? Where do we go next? I think uh, some sort of, sorry, I'm just going in. Uh, but yeah, I think it was interesting to sort of think through, uh, I think, you know, sort of my takeaway from this meeting was to think through the kind of methodological questions that were raised. Um, I think uh, in general, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, questions that were raised by the participants also uh, point to the uh, kind of overlapping of these concepts, you know, margins, peripheral urbanization, subaltern urbanization. And, um, you know, I think generally uh, within uh, the within uh, Subra's uh, sort of wrapping up was also the uh, question of like, what, what are our methodolo methodological premises for sort of capturing these processes? I certainly also feel that, for example, uh, you know, my work on uh, Brickins also sort of, um, you know, I also struggle with this question of how to um, convert this uh, research and and to not sort of fall into that uh, anthropological trap of exploitative research and um, how to sort of understand uh, peripheral urbanization, but also sort of work with it. So how does, um, you know, how does, you know, everyday uh, looking, everyday concepts of looking at uh, work in the Brickins, uh, how would that sort of scale out to inform uh, urban policy, which also has sort of a very large impact on uh, subjects outside of its borders. Uh, so for me is to sort of challenge all these methodological questions and to, um, you know, as Subra pointed out, to uh, bring out 
uh, new ways in which we can um, think through policy as well as think through uh, you know new ways of doing research that uh, do not come across as uh, you know hit and run uh, kind of projects. Thanks so much, Pratik. You know, I, I'd love to actually speak to that. I think that's a, a very important discussion I think that we need to have, especially at this moment, right? Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic has made various kinds of field work, you know, just, uh, I think, logistically so much more difficult. And at the same time, you know, you're absolutely right that, you know, what are the kinds of relationships that we are building in the field? Uh, so, uh, but I before, before I go ahead, I would definitely like to give, Give it over to perhaps uh, Ankita or Liu Bing who might want to respond to Pratik or maybe you know take on the challenge that uh, Dr. Kumar has for us. Uh, I think I'll just like to speak from my experience uh, in doing field work in Punjab. I think I think the biggest uh, challenge that I kind of faced and, and it's also methodological in terms of the kind of relationship, uh, how to capture these 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 multiple these various complex kind of relationships. So, for example, I could see that there is some relationship, uh, some some kind of relationship between the Jats and the Banias. But I, I I could then sense that there's a there's a significant differentiation even within the Jats. And then I could see that there's a there's a the groups are kind of extremely differentiated. And one, uh, we, I think we start with looking at these larger groups. But but when you go deeper, you see that. The inequality is is, is, is is it's kind of deep there, and how do you kind of understand these complex relationships? Because these relationships are also changing within the group, uh, within the jats. There is this idea of refugee six uh, who would like to kind of I, I I kind of vaguely get this get this thing into my thesis where I kind of understand that there is a lot of uh, things changing within the jats. For example, refugee six would like to not identify with the Indian Sikhs. Refugees are essentially who've migrated from the uh, from the Pakistan part of Punjab, and and the Malwai Sikhs are the Indian Punjabs, uh, Indian Punjabi Jat Sikhs. They're both Jat Sikhs, but but they're, they're, there's a very complex relationship. They even when I was trying to do interview uh, survey interviews, uh, refugee Jat Sikhs. Uh, when you talk talk about the caste thing, they talk they they write in terms of they force you to kind of they kind of tell you to write it's refugee Jat, and we are Malwai Jat. Uh, so these relationships are extremely, extremely, uh, you would not at the first go be able to kind of understand these relationships, but 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 how do you actually kind of capture these very changing relationships? So I I, I think it's a methodological question as well as I mean how would how would how would one do field work kind of in in in, in such uh, complex kind of area. So I, I yeah, I think for me that was that's a way for I, I would like to kind of get deeper into aspects of intra-group dynamics in these urban, which, which probably I haven't kind of gotten deeper into my thesis, but get kind of, yeah, yeah, that, that's something that I would like to explore. I'm not sure about the methodology, but, but yes, yes, that, that will be a challenge. Um, I, I, I really agree with what, what Ankita was saying. Uh, so like this kind of, uh, Relationality is like so difficult to unravel between different kinds of uh, geographical and cultural contexts, although like maybe they have the same name. And um, and I was like, cause I want to, I want, I do, I want to do comparative work, and I feel like um, just comparison is um, is important and difficult because I, I, we we like I feel like we really need to strike a balance between this, uh, uh, like bring, bring different parts of the world together at the same time, not homogenize uh, the, the things at the same thing because they are different. Uh, so I think that just like between China and India, like for example, it's just like the two countries are very different, but, but there are so many things that I feel like it's it, it, extremely important to bring them together, to dis, discuss uh, them together uh, for, for, Today we talked about this fragmentation in the uh, in the uh, peripheries, and also there are some other questions of uh, uh, labor conditions in 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 times of like most of the countries are really like uh, 
like really pushing the country forward in terms of economic development and really disciplining the laborers and etc. And then the housing conditions for for the laborers. There, there are so many things we can discuss discuss them together. But at some time um, to um, to really uh, to really to really also uh, like. Uh, really, really, uh, really focus on this kind of very specific uh, local, uh, local conditions, like with kind of ethnographic, uh, ethnographic, very deep ethnographic work to bring that uh, local local condition out, and local story out, and to give voice to the very uh, lo local, uh, to to the the give voice to the local residents and various different kind of local residents, so that's very important to uh, strike the balance. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Li Binga. Um, any other panelists would like to come in? Um, Carolina, what do you yeah. like? To yeah, yeah uh, honestly, I think different note. Um, more of a conceptual or a category problem. Um, I think a lot of this discussion on agrarian organism, organization, and so on has, and, and especially on the, the kind of post-colonial critique of organization theory, has really destabilized the category of the urban, right? Is that, you know, we no longer find these categories to really serve our purpose, and yet we go on talking about intersections and boundaries between these two kinds of spaces. Um, but then what would happen if we dispense with the categories, right? Um, and, you know, so practically speaking, I think we're looking at so many different types of spaces, it would be nice to describe them with more kind of fine-tuned language. Um, but then I was thinking that then, you know, if you were to simply say that let's do away with these categories, then what about the practical problem? Um, and this relates to the question of the census count, right? That, why do we have this category of census count? Because we find this, this process of, you know, of, of workers moving out of agriculture and when a certain percentage of the, of the male worker population um, becomes non-agricultural in their main occupation, it gets defined as urban. And yet there could be something not really very urban in other kinds of everyday meanings about those spaces, right? So then I was thinking about, I mean, I'm thinking about this whole question of how would you actually then define these kind of spaces more um, precisely. But then there is a problem that if you really wanted to redo these categories to capture better what's happening in these different spaces, um, you can't really do that because researchers depend on these large data sets, census data, NSS data. And um, the people who organize these uh, surveys are very reluctant to change categories for good reason because then you can't do comparison over time, right? So it's almost as if you're stuck with these legacy categories in the census, for example, which do not at all capture the reality of, of the 21st century. But then this is maybe a question more for the statisticians and demographers and so on. I don't know how you would fix that, but there always seems to be a kind of dissonance between the data you can get from these large um, you know, data sets and then what you see happening on the ground and how do you actually bring them together um, in your analysis. And this links, sorry, one footnote, this links um, to Patrick's question about labor migration, right? Because a lot of the reason why these villages are being recategorized as census town is because of layout migration, because most of the male voters are actually becoming labor migrants. So how do you then factor the question of labor and migration into understanding the urban in a, in, a, in a way that is not so kind of 19th century as what we see in the census. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kumar, for those, uh, you know, the, these questions, which of course are, are very challenging. Um, I just, just as a reaction, I'd say that, you know, um, scholarship, Global South the scholarship um, it is, I think, uh, really leading the way with regard to some of this, you know, um, I guess, epistemological kind of innovations that we're talking about. Um, 
you know, the, the whole idea of peripheral urbanization, I mean, this is Teresa Caldera uh, kind of coined that, that expression working uh, on Brazil. And, and, you know, the idea is that, um, you know, some of these categories like gentrification, which you mentioned, which is, which is a very important category in urban studies and in suburban kind of studies in the global north, um, just doesn't really, you know, work or doesn't capture, I mean, it's not, it's not effective necessarily in some of the contexts in which, in which we work in, in the global south. And, and, and I think that that just demonstrates, you know, the need for, um, you know, kind of post-colonial theory building from the south. And um, another thing you mentioned about, you know, some of the problems of, of urbanization. I mean, you know, urbanization is definitely not going away. I mean, this is the, the, the movement. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that we can be very um, conscious of, and, and I think, uh, and maybe even engaged with, is, is trying to ensure that this urbanization is not exclusionary. And um, this, this is the challenge uh, of our time. And, and this spans you know, global uh, north and global south. Um, and, and I think uh, the, the work on right to the city, for instance, which is uh, you know, kind of a, a catchphrase that, that captures uh, you know, this, this uh, I think the politics of, of urbanization, um, is is really important and and needs to needs to move forward. You know, as as Shubra rightly said, you know, it's it's fine to talk about sustainability, um, but we we have to remember that social sustainability is is perhaps the most important dimension of that of that triangle uh, beyond economic growth and 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 care for the environment. Um, so I guess I'd end on that note. Um, complexifying our, our conception of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just like to say a couple of things, if I may, uh, yes. you know, just to wrap this up. Uh, you know, and um, after, you... after Dr. Sood, uh, uh, Dr. Gudnani will also? Yeah. 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 yeah, okay, great. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think one is I just like to put in a plug for a paper, you know, just also speaking about collaboration, as Shubra was saying, you know, uh, paper, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Ramohan and Devdatta are here, also Rajkumar, who contributed to our paper, and Lorraine and I. Uh, we worked on sort of, uh, you know, uh, looking at, you know, the question of methodology ultimately, you know, questions of data justice. Uh, in peri-urban Hyderabad. And I think one of the things that really comes out of that is, you know, what Pratik was saying, you know, how do you sort of build relationships in the field that do not feel uh, exploitative? And I really think that particularly in this moment of the pandemic, you know, uh, working towards participatory approaches, right? Uh, building relationships that will actually, uh, you know, allow you a window into your site over a, the long term is, is perhaps the way to go. And certainly our work uh, in, in this vasti that, you know, we worked on in peri-urban Hyderabad, I think one of the main insights there is that, you know, quantitative data, uh, you know, uh, exercises often feel very extractive to communities, right, and for good reason. And so that is why qualitative methods are really important. But at the same time, I think I, I do want to address, you know, Carol's point about, you know, uh, sort of the census categories and, you know, uh, the survey categories. And I think that there's perhaps a reconciliation possible through the concept of the region, which I think we've not really talked about so far. But, you know, uh, whether we think about migration or rather actually new forms of commuting, on which we don't have a lot of data, you know, one of the ways to sort of reconcile a lot of what we are seeing in these disparate uh, case studies is daily uh, emergence of new kinds of regions. Uh, and certainly I have paid more attention to metropolitan regions, but of course, you know, there are regions uh, that are emerging, you know, for example, uh, in Patiala district or, you know, elsewhere. And I think that that's something that, you know, that may be a category that uh, we have not deployed enough, particularly in India, maybe to an extent even in China. And perhaps that's a category that allows us to uh, bring together a lot of what we are speaking uh, and methodologically help, helps us to reconcile the quantitative insight and the qualitative uh, field work. Anything that you would like to say, Shubra? 
I have more questions uh, <laughs> than we started off with, so not really to add, but I think uh, just to reiterate the, some of the points which have been made, uh, especially what uh, Carol is saying about what what does it what does the category of urban urban mean, and this moment, and you know, if you work in like I do in the villages of Gurgaon, what is urban, what is rural, what is an urban village? I mean, what are these kind of oxymorons which allow us to complicate this terrain, but also how and if can we intervene in think and how can we have a conversation with uh, census and uh, demographers to rethink these spaces? Will it help, will it not? So I do not know, answer, I don't have answers, but more questions that what if, uh, what does the, how generative is the capacity and space of the urban mean? And perhaps for all of us, I think the periphery offers that kind of decentering and dislodging the centrality of some of these categories. So periphery as a space outside, which is outside the box in some sense to problematize these uh, tensions which are coming out in the papers, the complexity which of, uh, the social relations, social structures, which both Lubing and Akita are talking about, the questions which are coming up, and if if it's possible to, you know, reinvigorate the debate around these categories itself and the epistemological and methodological mm -hmm. uh, openings that this decentering may offer. So, nothing more than just saying yes. These questions remain, and hopefully, uh, will keep us going for a while. Thank you on that note. Thank you. So let me also quickly propose a, a formal vote of thanks. Yes, a very long session. So uh, really, I would like to thank uh, all of you joining here. And it was really a nice experience when Ashima Ma'am and other editors also encouraged to have a focused discussion. And really, uh, most of the times we create a panel discussion, but it was already uh, a, a good volume of work already there in the journal. Uh, and we have also linked uh, on our event page, they link it uh, to the journal, uh, uh, everyone can see. And uh, I would like to congratulate all the authors and editors for this very uh, special uh, volume on engaging the urban from the periphery. And uh, indeed, it was our pleasure to have uh, all of you here. Uh, so uh, on behalf of IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, I, I would like to thank all of you for joining in our uh, cities, the state of uh, cities, hashtag city conversations, and today's deliberation on engaging the urban from the periphery. And uh, we had uh, all the, Zufay ma'am could not join, but all the others author here. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shubhra Gurmani ma'am, Dr. Lauren Kennedy ma'am, Dr. Dr. Ash Ashma Sudman, Professor Carol Opadhyay, uh, Lubing Zing, Pratik Mishra, Ankita Radhi. And uh, really uh, very fortunate to have very young researchers with you doing very nice work. So I must congratulate all the editors also. And uh, with that, we look forward to having more of uh, your work also, uh, having fe featuring in our series also, and uh, look forward to interacting more and learning from your uh, excellent work. Uh, thank you once again. Have a nice day and please take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Share the videos and podcasts soon. Thank you. Yes, Bye. Absolutely. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Bye.